you really do have an awesome pastor. And he really does have a crazy wife. Uh, man, I call her Mama J. Jill is absolutely insane. River's as cute as can be. And Abby and Kaylee are really, really cool. You got a great church here, and we're building something together. Can you say together this morning? Ah, yeah. oh, you did it so good. I'm not going to do that thing where people make you repeat it because you didn't do it good enough because you did it good enough. Earlier you left Emily out, like, hanging a little bit. She had to make you do it, but... But you did really good. In fact, no, we're going to repeat it one more time. Say together. Yeah. Let me, t wow, gosh. <laughs> Let me tell you something. One of the most holy attributes God's church can display is unity. Last week, we began to learn how we live a holy life when we ourselves have a little bit of a mess going on. We're a little bit of a mess. We're learning how to individually live for God despite the fact that we have imperfections. Sounds hard enough. Does anyone struggle with that? I do. I sincerely do. We're going to take it a step further, though. It's no longer just seen as an individual effort. Today we're going to do something really difficult. You already struggle trusting yourself and, and living a holy life while your life is a mess. How about trusting each other? living a life together. One of the most holy things we can display to God and to the world around us is living a life of unity. But it's really, really difficult. And it's not even really a mindset that's integrated into today's culture. You know, does anybody like action movies? We got any action movie people in here? Go ahead, you know, yeah, raise your hand, make a little noise. What about chick flick people? You really like it? Wow. We see where the passion's at in the room. Uh, action movies. There's these classic characters like James Bond or, or like all these actors that play these heroes like uh, Tom Cruise or Jason Statham or like, like a Liam Neeson type of character. And whenever they're on a mission and someone tries to help them, there's another character, a group of characters that says, hey, we can help. You don't have to do this alone. We want to jump in it with you. The main character always pushes them away. It's Liam Neeson, he would say something like, no, it's too dangerous. I have to do this alone. And you're thinking, if it's dangerous, why are you doing this alone? We're supposed to live life together. Which, can I make a side note right now? Because I've been thinking about this a lot lately, because I worked on that impression a lot. And I thought, how great would it be if all of these action movies were Christian movies? What if you had Liam Neeson pick up the phone? I don't know who you are. But I know that Jesus loves you. He will look for you. He will find you. And he will kill your sin. Amen. We're not meant to do life alone. It's summed up incredibly well in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It gives us so much. There's three distinct things I want to pull out of this specific verse. But you are a chosen race, a chosen people, a race or a people group. It speaks to more than just an individual person. This verse does not say you're a chosen person. It says you're a chosen race, a chosen people group, a holy nation. A nation is made up of more than just an individual, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In this singular verse, hear me today, you're given an identity with a group, with a purpose. You're given who you are in life, your identity, you're given a group who you live life with, and you're given a purpose, what you live life for. God is contributing it to you. And clearly, clearly in this verse where you're called to holiness together as a group, given a mission to spread the gospel to everyone around you, clearly he's saying you're not meant to do this alone. This is not an action movie. This is real life. This is Christianity. And unity is one of the largest displays to the world around us that we can display holiness and love. So that begs the question, now that we've built up this message, now that we've built up unity, let's say what unity is for, how we live it out, and what it can result in. Let's start with the power. There's incredible power in unity. 
You probably already know this, but entertain me a little bit because I want to point out a verse that I don't think is preached about a lot. It has an incredible point, but it might not be built on because it actually speaks to an evil purpose, a purpose that was against God. And it's Genesis chapter 11, verse 6. Let me give you some background because I'm showing you the power of unity. The sheer power of people coming together with a common goal and a common mission. It is a post-flood world. God has called his people to spread out, to do a distinct thing, and they have joined together. People that God identified and chose to save, it wasn't really in their own righteousness that he did that, although they displayed some character in order to be on the ark, but it was in his good grace and love that he identified them as people that he would save. He got this group together, and then he gave them a purpose, but they didn't want to live that purpose. Two out of three isn't bad, but it's not good enough in this circumstance. When you don't live according to the purpose of God, things will fall apart. But it is special when you live in unity. After the flood, these people came together and they started building a tower. Instead of following God, they tried to build a kingdom for themselves. And the Lord said, behold, there are one people and they have one language. In other words, they're on the same page and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will be impossible for them. If God can say that about people that have a mission in mind apart from his will, how much more powerful is it when we join together as Christians and actually follow his purpose? There's power in unity. Nothing on earth can stop these people that have come together with a common goal and a common mission, but there's something outside of earth, there's something divine. There is a God who divided them and stopped them. Unity is powerful. Unity in Christ is unstoppable. Their problem is they were trying to build a kingdom for themselves when they should have always been trying to build the kingdom of God. I'm gonna need some volunteers for this next part because we're gonna talk about how to live in unity. I meant when I said it, and to be transparent, it's gotta be at least a little bit of a struggle for all of us. Living a holy life while acknowledging that you have flaws, while acknowledging that you make mistakes and things get a little bit messy and you're always repenting and turning to God and trying to use your mess as a message, both your good actions and your bad actions. It's hard enough to live a holy life. Now, how do I, you're hearing a message today, so it should beg the question, how do I actually live a holy life with other people? There's a bond that brings us together. So Trenton, can you come up on stage? Caleb, David. And I'll tell you what, I want somebody a little bit bigger. I want somebody with some meat on them. Josh, can you come on stage? Is that okay? Yeah, get on up here. Josh is a big boy. He lived those big weights. I need you guys, just, just line up and put your arms together like campfire style, just kumbaya it up. Man, this is gonna be good. You don't have back problems, do you? No. Okay, good. <laughs> Not today. Not today, devil. How do we live in unity? What bonds us together? In Colossians, which is a book like a lot of the letters, it's just an explanation of how to live this Christian life. And it says in the book of Colossians, chapter three, verse 13 and 14, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. How do we live in unity? This verse distinctly shows us quite a few things. One is don't let petty problems stand in the way of being a brother or sister of Christ. It's a poor example to the world and it's a horrible way to live. It's not God's will. First John's clear, you can't claim to love God and hate your brother or sister. You can't claim to be in the light while walking in darkness. There's nothing in you. So what binds us together? That verse was so clear that it's love. It's the love of God. And the love that he has for us and the love that he's instilled in us makes us capable. His power, his supernatural love living in us makes it capable for us to lock together like they're locked together today. In other words, how do we live in unity? We have to stand with each other. It's time to stop living in a Christian world where Christians are so divided, always debating, not just about topics, but about people, whether they're good enough or not. 
or whether they can do things that I can do because there's some kind of goodness and badness scale that doesn't exist and I put myself over here on the teeter-totter while I put someone else down there. And what if it seems like they deserve it? What if they make a mistake? What if their life is a mess just like your life is a mess but when other people mess up, you want justice and when you mess up, you want grace? We stand together. We stand with each other. And I'm telling you, you want to see something powerful? You want to see a change in Dixon, Tennessee? I know it's what God wants to see, and I know it's what Pastor Jamie wants to see. You're not going to find a more passionate man about a city than Jamie is about Dixon. But really, it's God's vision for his world and for this city to be united and stand together. And that image, that sheer image, will be incredibly powerful. People living in their identity, not as individuals, but as a group, bonded together with God's love, living out a purpose. But there is something that happens. You. Yeah, I'm going to pick you because you're the youngest and it's a lot easier to pick the youngest. What happens when you're standing together with someone truthfully does, like we're all a mess, we're all imperfect, but somebody really does fall away a little bit. Down, down. Like faint. No, no, let him go, let him go, let him go. That actually would have been a good example too, but let him go, get on the ground. Thank you. What happens when somebody really falls away? What happens when their life is such a mess that now they used to serve on a team, but now they're not serving and now they're not really returning your text or phone calls and you've kind of tried to reach out to them, but you know the lifestyle that they're living is not an action that they took, it's a lifestyle that they're living. They become comfortable with things that they should always have been uncomfortable with. The same person that was at a Bible study with you six months ago, helping you through a hard time, has now fallen into a moment, into a lifestyle where he's no longer living for God and he actually is finding it difficult to connect with God at all. What do we do? Do we gossip about them? Do we put their downfall on the stage like I just did for all to see? Do we say, you know... They're messing up. They used to be a part of the team. If they want to come back, they can come back. But it's up to them. The ball's in their court. Man, that's a leave them alone mentality. That's while someone is drifting away. Instead of extending a hand, throwing them an oar, throwing them a life jacket, a way to get back, that is letting them drift further and further to where you can't see them and you might accidentally not think about them anymore, whether it's gossip, whether you're trying to cut them down, although you should be lifting them up. We see a moment where you used to stand together. Someone's life is a complete mess. They have fallen away. How do we respond? Here's how I think we do it. And you two can head off the stage. I need the big guy. We stand with each other. And we lift each other up. Not only do we lift them up, don't clap yet. We dust them off. That's good. That's good. We give them a hug. That's good. What a, hey, we're not done yet. We put them on our shoulders. Go ahead. Use your back. You get them. I want, I want people to see this image. Can we, can we go for about two minutes? We can go for about two minutes. Let me tell you something today. You stand together. Man, they've got the motion down. Hey, I've only got two minutes because I don't know how long this is going to last. There we go. We stand together. When someone falls away, we pick them up and we put them on our shoulders. See, there was a field. There was a hundred sheep. One went missing into the wilderness. One completely fell away. One went out of sight of the good shepherd. He was not complacent. He wasn't happy with the fact that 99 were in the field. He could have ignored it. He could have let it wander. He could have said if he really wants to come back, he can come back. But instead, he went out searching and he searched and he didn't come home until he found the lost sheep. And when he found him, when he found what represents you when Jesus found us in our sin and our falling away, he didn't further separate himself from us. He didn't push us away. He didn't say, you awful and wicked sheep, if you want to, you can follow me, but wait a day, I'll leave a trail. He picked the sheep up, brought him all the way back home, and took him to a safe place. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
I think that's a relatable story. I think it's a familiar story. And I think I'm going to have to get somebody stronger for second service. <laughs> hey, security team, follow me to the parking lot. I don't want to see that man alone. <laughs> Peter is a man following Jesus. He's a disciple. And he finds himself in a particular situation. See, he's been slowly cleaning up his mess for years now. He's been following Jesus, still imperfect. And then he, he finds himself in this position of controversy. Jesus is coming to be arrested. Some enemies are coming to put him in handcuffs, lead him away to a place where no man would want to go, to a fate that no man would want to have. And Peter, in the face of his enemies, in the face of adversity, he doesn't love them. He doesn't put his hands up. He doesn't allow things to happen. He doesn't humbly stand in the way and say, this isn't what I want. I'm going to stand here and take whatever you have for him. It's for me too. I stand with him. There is someone living according to the law instead of living according to his Lord and Savior. And that person that came to help arrest him was not greeted by Peter, not loved by Peter. He was met by Peter's sword. Peter obviously swung for his head. He mostly missed, but he cut off his ear. Let's rewind the clock a little bit. A few years ago, Jesus is speaking to Peter and some other disciples. And he said, look, you're fishing after fish. But I've called you to be fishers of men. He gives them an identity as a group with an ultimate purpose calling them to live and learn in unity, something special. And then you get back to this moment. Peter is called to be a fisher of men, but instead he's being a swordsman. He is cutting away at the very thing God has called him to catch, and he's trying to destroy the very thing that Jesus has set him aside to restore. Jesus still persists, even in this moment, to show us the ultimate example of how we're supposed to pick people up. I'm speaking this message because I do think not even talking bad about other Christians, but more or less a problem is when they make mistakes, leaving them alone to fend for themselves. I think it's a problem that we could all benefit from coming together more in unity. Jesus takes what was severed. He takes what was severed. He takes this ear that was severed, which I don't think it directly uh, symbolizes this, but it makes me think of our relationship with him. When we sinned, when sin entered into the world, our relationship with God was severed. There was no way to put it back together. There was no hospital. There was no sewing kit. There was no way to truly restore it for everything that it had, for the capabilities that it was. Our relationship was fallen on the ground, separated from what we always should have been together with, in unity with God. And it was our own fault, cut away. And Jesus, as he bends down and gets this ear, he starts putting it back on this man's head. And it gets restored as if nothing had happened. And Jesus, carrying the cross, picking us up on his shoulders, bearing the weight of sin, carried that severed relationship to Mount Calvary. He died and he rose again. Why? He did it out of love, but he did it so we could live in unity with the God that loves us. He also did it so that we could live in unity together. There's power in unity. How do you live in unity? You stand together, and when someone falls away, it would have been a better example. You know what would have been better, Josh? Is if David and Trent would have stayed up here and helped you hold him up. When we're together, you saw what people can do when they're together and they're not serving God. Nothing on earth could stop them. But when we're together and we're serving God, nothing on earth can stop us, and God certainly won't stand in our way. I want to share with you as we close here, the result of unity. This is an example of the church that gets used very commonly. Sometimes I fight against it because, I mean, man, it's the church of Acts. They just became a church and they're on fire for God and it's quite a standard to live up to. In Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47, there's a lot of verses about them, but I just want to pick up right here. All who believed were together, together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending to the temple together, again, together, they were not alone, they were together. 
attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food and glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. I'm going to change a quote, okay? This is a famous quote. I'm going to change it a little bit because it speaks not just to addition, but multiplication of the love that we have for one another and the amount of people that I believe can come to know Jesus as their Savior if we as the church step up. You see, when we stand together, God's church stands strong. And it starts reaching more and more and more people. There's a quote that says, the world is yet to see what would happen if a man would live holy and consecrated to God. I want to tell you even further, the world has truly yet to see what will happen if a church, if people with an identity working together as a group to follow God's purpose, the world's yet to see what would happen if a church would live holy and separate yet together for God. The effect that it would have would be astronomical. It could hardly be measured. It may be difficult to live a life where you're trying to be holy and live as God would have you live while you're a mess. And it may be incredibly difficult to trust other imperfect people to live alongside of you. But if you choose not to trust, if you choose not to love, that's not what Jesus had in mind for his church. It's not what Jesus has in mind for your life. If there's one thing, if there's one thing, I could put it in the layman's terms for you today, it's that we need each other. And this is true. It is an attribute of holiness to live life together. How many people might be turned away by the church based off of how Christians treat each other or the world around them? We're going to be the church that loves, stands together, and that is open for everyone. Amen. Listen, we're going to pray, but if we pray and don't give the practical, we may leave unchanged. You've already heard two preliminary speakers talk about this. You want to live together, you want to get together in coffee shops or throughout the week or call each other and check on each other more, do it, do it, do it. But if you want to live together organically and you're not even living together yet in a structure, I don't know how far you'll go. Maybe you'll meet up with people who are calling for two or three weeks and then maybe you'll wake up seven months later and say, man, I just haven't been getting together with other people. At this church, we have a structure where you can be a part of a team or a group. You can be a part of something. You can come together and systematically, structurally pray together, have your identity in Christ, work together as a group, and actually fulfill a purpose. So organically come together, meet up with people, check on them, ask them questions, read the Bible, have a random Bible study, but also be a part of a consistent group that can encourage you, hold you accountable. When you fall away, actually pick you up. Be a part. So we're gonna pray, but know that the practical is this. Today, this very day, not for the sake of growing a kingdom like the people in Genesis chapter 11 were doing, but for the sake of growing God's church like the people in Acts chapter 2. I would love for our next step stations to be flooded, for us to be in a panic of so many people coming together, wanting to live in Christ as a group with a purpose. You want to change this city, you want to change this world. Start serving and meeting up together. Start structurally and then watch it happen just as a habit of